All right, I am going to record for this, and let's see if I can find it. I want to bring that up. I've got a bunch of stuff open, so let me see if I can close a few things here. That is not it. There it is. All right, do you see on your screen where it says how to work with interfaces? Yeah. Yes. All right. <clears throat> so I am taping and now we're gonna go over chapters 15 and 16. The good news is neither one of these chapters are real long, especially 16. It's probably the shortest one in the book. So I imagine we'll be done sometime between 10 and 1030. If you read the email that I sent with this new Zoom URL on it, I also attach to that the lab that you're going to do for chapters 15 and 16. Again, my hope is to be able to do some of those problems with you and then assign the rest. All right, so let's take a look. Yesterday, we went over the inheritance chapter. Now, we went over it kind of quickly. So just so you know what I am planning on doing, so you've got a little heads up. Now, you know Monday is the hands-on test. Tuesday, I think the way that we'll go over this is we're gonna, we're gonna write a program or either we're gonna write one or I'm gonna have it written already, but we're gonna look at it as a class. And it's, it's gonna start real simple and then it'll get more complex. And what I mean is we'll start probably with just one class, then we will, we will add inheritance to it, then we will add interfaces to that. I'm not sure if we'll get into any work with generics in here or not. All right, I think if we can handle, uh, go over interfaces and go over inheritance, we've already talked about abstraction and data hiding. And if we can go into and talk about polymorphism, we'll be good. So as it says, this chapter starts by showing you interfaces. Now, what you're gonna notice you may or may not remember this, but at the end of the lecture yesterday, we talked about an abstract class. And I mentioned that an abstract class is a class that can't be instantiated. For instance, if I walked into a bank and I said, hi, I wanna open up a bank account, probably the person I talked to would say, what kind of an account? Because to say that I wanna open up a bank account is too generic in nature. That said, all bank accounts have things in common. The person whose name is on the account, their address, city, state, zip, et cetera. So we could create an abstract class called accounts. And then based off of that, we could create classes that inherited from that, like checking account, savings account. All right, I think you get it, but just one more quick example. You know, if, if, if I, you know, when we eventually get back to where we're in the classroom and if I walk in and I'm really excited and you go, what's going on? And I say, I bought an animal. Probably the same kind of thing. Well, what kind of an animal? And if I say a dog, <clears throat> you'll say, what kind of dog? So I could create an abstract class called animal and I could say that all animals, for example, speak. All right, and all animals have a name and a breed, et cetera. I could make that in a very abstract manner and then inherit from there. The problem with using inheritance in the C-sharp programming language, and Java's the same way, 
is you can only have one parent that you inherit from. So the hierarchy would be, for example, like a great grandmother, then a grandmother, then a mother, then a daughter. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. All right. So what you can do to somewhat get around that is you can use interfaces. Because although you can only inherit from one class, you can implement as many interfaces as you need to in a program. So it says here interfaces are similar to abstract classes, but they have advantages to make them easier to create and more flexible. So this chapter, as it says, shows you how to use generics so you can code your own collections that work like the generic collections in .NET. What does that mean? Well, the built-in collections are things like a collection of integers, a collection of, of floats, a collection of Booleans, et cetera. But if you're writing a, uh, if, if you're writing your own, let's just say you're writing your own program and you want a collection of salespeople, all right, there is no built-in .NET collection of salespeople. So this chapter shows how you can do that. All right, so, all right. Along the way, it says you'll learn how to work with generic interfaces that are used with generic collections. All right, again, I don't wanna sit and read to you. They mention in here when you can have more than one parent, then you have what's known as multiple inheritance. In other words, you can get things from two or more parents. It's not supported in Java. It's not supported in C Sharp. As you see on the screen, it is supported in C++, and it's supported in Perl. And there are other languages that support multiple inheritance as well. All right. So it says all C Sharp does not support multiple inheritance, but it does support the idea of an interface, as does Java. An interface provides many advantages of multiple inheritance, without the problems that are associated with it. The problem that's associated with it is what's known as the diamond. And what it means is if you inherit from two different parents and both of you give you, give, give you something that has the same name, then which in the, you can only have one of them, which one did you get it from? That may not make any sense, all right? But you can look up, you know, multiple inheritance diamond effect if you want to. All right. So in some ways, as mentioned, an interface is similar to an abstract class. You're going to see a picture of it in just a second. You inherit from a class, you implement an interface. Now, what's, what's the difference? Again, you can only inherit from one class. So when you have the name of your class, and, and you have the colon there, and you wanna put another class after it, there can only be one class. But you can add as many interfaces after that as you want to or need to. So as it says, C Sharp can inherit only one class, but it can implement more than one interface. So when you think about how this is set up, what it's saying is C Sharp can inherit from zero classes or one at a max, all right? And C Sharp can implement zero or more interfaces. So it's zero or one for inheritance, zero to as many as you want to or need to with interfaces, all right? So we're gonna look at these examples that are right here. Again, it's, common practice that when you create an interface and you name it, you start it with the letter I. When you see something in a program that starts with a capital I, you're supposed to basically gravitate, navigate towards, oh, that's probably an interface. So let's say that you, well, what if I had a class that I wanted to create called interest? All right. Instead of calling it interest, you'd probably call it bank interest. So again, this is an interface. This is not a class, all right? So here is a, a class that inherits from or implements, in this case, this interface. 
So notice it's the colon, just like we saw yesterday with classes. So why would you want to do this? Because again, you can have as many of these as you need to have, and that's what they're saying. So from the bottom of the page here, both interfaces and abstract classes provide signatures for properties and methods. So this says that if you are going to implement this interface, you must add this method. It must return a string, it must be called display text, and it must have a string passed into it. All of the members of an abstract class, they're automatically abstract. I'm sorry, say it again. All of the members of an interface are automatically abstract, but an abstract class can have some non-abstract members if you want to do that. A class can inherit only once from another class, but can implement as many interfaces as necessary. Interfaces can't declare static members, abstract classes can. So what is an interface? As it says down on the bottom of the page, it's a set of signatures. So what it is, is it's like you come in here and you go, you know what? If you want to use my, if you want to use, you know, my code, then you have to agree. An interface is, for lack of better words, it's kind of like a contract. I'll give you these services, but you've got to use, uh, learn to use them in this way. Am I right in assuming that either from me or from your own reading, that the two of you have both heard of the term application program interface? Yeah. All right, yeah. or, a, or API, all right. What an API is, is it's basically a contract between you and software. Software says, I'll give you these services. And you say, fine, then I'll agree to use them in the way that you meant me to use them. All right, and that's what we're talking about right here. Again, they begin with the letter I, and to implement them, you must name the interface and you must provide the implementation for everything. So notice how this class that implemented that interface now has a get <coughs> display text that passes in a string and that returns a string. All right, there are a bunch of interfaces defined in the by the .NET framework. Okay, so let's take a look at these. Again, you don't have to memorize these or anything else. You don't have to do that. All right. We've got a clonable. When you do when you use clonable, what you're doing is you're making a copy of an object. Now that may not sound like much, you're used to doing stuff like this. You say int x equals seven. Then on your next line, you say int y equal x. Well, that now they both hold the number seven. Big, big deal. But if you've got a if you've created an object and that object is unbelievably complex, you can use clonable on it and make a copy of everything and then go in and make some changes to the copy. All right, I comparable compares objects. And I may have told you about this the other day, I don't remember. When you compare two objects, if the first object that you're comparing to the second, if the first one is less than the second one, all right, then I comparable returns a negative number, usually negative one. If you compare two objects and they're identical, then I comparable returns zero. If you compare two objects and the first one is considered greater than the second, I comparable returns a positive number, typically positive one. All right. Then there's I convertible, and you can see the ones that are in there. Converts an object of one of the common language runtime types. 
we're not going to probably get into that. I mean, some of that stuff, as you could probably guess, is pretty darn heavy. All right. Then there's the eye disposable. Now, that one actually kind of is important. We won't talk about that now. But later on, when we talk about databases, that dispose is important. Why? Because as it says, free up unmanaged resources. So if you've got a connection to a database and you don't need it anymore, typically you're going to end up calling the dispose method, which just says, hey, I don't need this connection anymore. All right. There are other ones here. There's I enumerable. Gets an enumerator for a collection. You may or may not remember we talked a little bit earlier about enumerations. And enumeration is a user-defined data type. So in other words, if I wanted to create my own data type called days of the week, and I wanted it to hold Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I could do that. Well, the I enumerable allows you to work with your own enumerations. <clears throat> Now, you'll notice there's this one that allows you to do almost anything with it. Then there's this one. It's read only and it's forward only. You might find that confusing. That's kind of known when you've got something that's read only, forward only, it's known as a fire hose. Because literally, it's like when the fire person turns on the hose, the water just comes out and it comes out straight, all right? in much the same way and you're going to you're going to work with this fire hose type of thing with databases if you open up a database in that way if it's got 100 records in it and you're on record 15 as an example you can look you can look at records 15 through 100 but you can't back up and look at records 1 to 14 there's i collection that does things like I int count to show you how many things you have in the collection and some other stuff. There's I list, which manages a list of objects. Again, that I that you see in all of those stands for interface. All right. And there's I dictionary. What's the difference between a list and a dictionary? You've already looked a little bit at, at a regular list. We worked with those. But a dictionary is kind of like a real life dictionary. It works with what are called key value pairs. So it's like if I didn't know what the word collection meant, let's say, I would go to the dictionary, I would look under the C's, and I would find the word collection. That's the key. And once I looked, it would show me the definition. That's the value. All right. And I'm, I'm just giving you my own verbiage. You can read down here. Theirs might be much better than mine. So how do you create one of these interfaces? Public, the word interface, notice there's no return type, just the name of the interface. Then inside of curly braces, all right, inside of curly braces, you put down what that interface is supposed to have in it. So here's an example of an interface that has two methods in it and it has a property. The property is has changes with a get set and the methods are read and save. So if, if I come in and create a class that inherits from I persistible, I must put in these two, these two methods read and save, and I must put in this property has changed or changes. And they show examples of that. So as it says, when you create an interface and you declare it, it's similar than declaring a class, but you use interface instead of the word class. As it says, when you create methods and properties in an interface, all you do is you say that it has this, and it has this, and it has this. You don't do any implementation. You don't tell the user how this is supposed to be implemented, or how this, or how this are supposed to be implemented. 
That's what the programmer does. All right. Methods and properties that are declared in an interface cannot include an implementation. And don't include these access modifiers, public, private, protected, etc. It says all members are expected or considered to be public. All right. So how do you implement that? Again, we're going over this. If you have not read the chapter, it's probably making little to no sense. I'd expect that. That's OK. If you have time, when you have time, at least page through the chapter. We will go through an example of this next week that includes both, both um, several classes that we will end up creating our own simplistic little class hierarchy, but we'll also include at least one interface. So there is a class product that implements the iClonable interface. Here's one that product has or implements two interfaces. Here, book inherits from product and it implements two interfaces. Some of it is just a bunch of verbiage that you've got to get used to using. <clears throat> so as mentioned on the bottom of the page here, to declare a class that implements one or more inter interfaces, you type in a colon, just the same way we do it for inheritance. All right, if you're both inheriting, like we're doing here, and implementing these, the class you're inheriting from must come first. Product must become before I clonable and I displayable. Why? That's just the rules of the language. After you enter the name of an interface, you can automatically generate stubs. To do that, it'll come up with a light bulb here. If you click on the light bulb, it'll create that for you. It'll be almost empty, but it's just a way that you can do it where there's a little less code you have to write. So here's a product class that implements I clonable. So what's new here? All right, these two things are new. This is what's in the class. These are the class variables. This is the constructor. All right, this is the stuff that's under the clone. All right, and this, what was there under the iDisplayable that we saw before. This will only make sense if you look at the examples that are in here. Now I'm going to try to make sure that when you do your test for chapters 14 and to, through 16, which won't be, will not be next week, but it'll probably be at the end of the next week, or I'm sorry, it will not be next week, but it'll probably be at the beginning of the following week. All right. I want to make sure that at that time you have an understanding of what's going on here. And I also don't want it where we're going to have a class hierarchy that is so big that you're like, okay, I get it, but man, this is way too much for me to handle. I don't want to do that and snow you over with details. You can pass an interface in as a parameter. There you're passing it in. So notice when you declare it in here, you have to tell the type. It's very similar to what we've been doing before. Now, look at this example. I'm not going to go over it with you. It probably will make little to no sense. But if you look at the example that's here, and then you look at the output, if it's starting to make at least a little bit of sense to you, that's where you should be. So as it says, you can declare a parameter that's used by a method as an interface type. All right. As the product class that we have been looking at here implements both iClonable and iDisplayable, it can be passed as an argument that accepts either iClonable or iDisplayable. All right. That's, believe it or not, the first half of the chapter. Now we're going into generics. And the author mentions here that back in chapter eight, we talked a little bit about generics. You probably don't remember it. Most of, with most programs, you don't use stacks, you don't use queues. All right, you may or may not use, what's the difference between a list and a sorted list? 
You already know that. A sorted list is sorted based on one of the something that's in the list. But we've started to work a little bit with lists. All right. But rather than lists, as we've been doing, we can customize them. Notice custom list, product, product equals new custom list. Why would you want to do that? Because it allows you to be even more granular, so to speak, and to create what's referred to as a generic collection. All right. So as the author says, you can use generics to define a type safe collection that can accept an element of any type. So here's some examples. It, it's, it, I know it looks really confusing, at least to me it did, when I first started looking at it. And to be honest with you, occasionally it still does. This T in here means type. doesn't have to be a T, but people just use that. All right? Again, you will have to read this. We will look at some of this when we go over the examples next week. All right? Then they go through the code that uses the public class. And again, if you have not yet read the chapter, this stuff will probably make virtually zero sense to you. I did go back. I mentioned this to you before. But if you go to my YouTube channel, I did go back and I redid lectures on all of these based on the PowerPoints that come with them. If that helps you, go back and look at that. So here's some of the generic interfaces defined by .NET. Some of these you've already seen. All right. There's a lot more that are defined than what are shown here. These are just the ones that you would use the most often. Are we going to use any of these? I hope so. All right. Then they go into how to implement iComparable. This is what I mentioned to you before. This is when you compare two things. And if one, if the first one that you're comparing is greater than the second one, it'll return a number greater than zero. If the first one is less than the second one, it'll return a negative number. If the two are the same, it will return zero. And that's explained right here. And again, you might say, why, why who cares? Well, again, depending a lot of times what are going to be in these classes or what could be in here. All right, you see an example here. All right, but it could be something that's, you know, that you're pulling out of a database where you're comparing values in there. This stuff is used a lot more than you probably would think it is. All right. You can also put constraints in here. And as they say on the bottom, when you define a generic class, you can use constraints to restrict the data types that the generic class accepts. So in other words, if you make it generic, generic implies that it can accept anything. But you might want it to accept anything as long as it's of a certain class, as an example. All right, so here's how to implement the I enumerable interface. And again, as it says, there is a for each loop that is used right in here. It says it works on generic collections that implement the I enumerable. As a result, if you want to use a for each, all right, you must implement the I enumerable interface. And you'll notice up here, that's exactly what they did. Here's how to code an interface that uses generics. I think we're just about done, yep. This is a lot to swallow, all right? This is, to, in my humble opinion, by far, this is the hardest thing in the book. I think when we go into databases, you may struggle somewhat with those in a couple of weeks, but I think by and large, you're gonna understand what we're talking about. This stuff is not easy to understand. So again, what I'd like you to do, not right this second, oh boy, uh, what I'd like you to do 
But like I said, not not in this at this second. But what I'd like you to do is go back and read the chapter. All right. Now it says I'm down to 10 minutes. We've got one more chapter to go over. It's not a big chapter, but I don't want to be cut off part way into it. So again, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop the lecture here. Sorry, we got to do it this way, but we do have to do it this way. It is 9.56, so I'll plan on at around 10.10, I will send you the last URL um, for the last part of the meeting that we'll do. We should be able to bang this thing out in about 20 minutes. Make sense to both of you? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Keegan? Yeah. All right. So let's come back, like I said, in about 10 minutes too. I'll see you then.